Bonjour and welcome. We hope you'll join us for a cup of tea today. We have an expression at Lord's Volunteers that we love it when Our Lady introduces us to her friends. And we have some wonderful friends here today. So let's begin with a prayer. Father, you are Father Sean Grismer from? The Diocese of Rockford in Illinois. And you come with us on pilgrimage. I do. Many times. It's my pleasure. What a, what a yeah. blessing. Yeah. And so Father's going to open us in prayer and then we're going to meet a special friend of Lord's Volunteers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, we thank you and we praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has given us his mother, and he was upon the cross, and he said, Behold your mother. And Jesus, we now ask for the gift of Our Lady, particularly Our Lady of Lords, the Immaculate Conception, to be with us in this time of prayerful conversation as we come to know you a bit more through the testimony of your daughter. We thank you that you have moved in her life. We just now ask Jesus for the gift of your Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, to grant our hearts humility, and to grant us your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So sweet Allie. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me today. We're so excited. I'm so always happy to see you. Yes, but, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. So I've known you since you were way little 12, right? Yeah, yeah. almost 20 years. Can you believe that? No, I can't. I, I, I'm so much younger and thinner than I look. <laughs> <laughs> you look great as always, Marlene. But, and obviously we're so excited, a new baby on the way too. Yeah, this is my third, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so how exciting. So why don't you tell Father how it is that you first came to Lourdes? Okay, so, um, well, my family and I, I'm the oldest of five kids, and my family and I were stationed in Germany because my dad was in the military. And um, when I was about 12 years old, my godmother um, contacted my mom because she wanted to bring her kids on this uh, pilgrimage opportunity to Lourdes. And so my mom was like, oh, please take, take my daughter. I was 12 at the time. <laughs> and um, I feel like 12 is a very uh, angsty, kind of rebellious, early, you know, preteen stage for any person to go through. Um, but I was particularly difficult at this age. Um, I really, there was a lot of stuff kind of going on in my home life and um, a lot of stuff going on with me internally. So I was just like really angry and just really... Um, just like antagonistic and stubborn and strong-willed and wanted really nothing to do with faith or church or whatever. I hadn't really made faith my own yet. And so my mom was, you know, practically begging my godmother, please take her with you. <laughs> and so anyway, I, um, my mom told me I was going to go and I laughed at her and told her that I was not going to spend 10 days of my summer helping sick and old people because that was a waste of my time. <laughs> And, um, you know, don't but, hold back. Don't yeah, hold the back. whole thing, the whole thing. And, you know, but my, if you know my godmother, she's super holy, you know, Irish God fearing woman. You don't argue with her. Like if she says you're going to do something, you're going to do it. And so I ended up going and, um, yeah, it just completely changed. I think it was the first time because I went with, it was a youth pilgrimage. So I went with a bunch of other, um, youth. Most of them were a little bit older than me, about 14, maybe 15. Um, and so I was definitely the youngest, um, along with my god, my godmother's son, who was around my same age as well. Um, but it was the first time that I had seen people from all over the world come um, to find rest and healing and um, to just kind of make faith like the central point of their lives. Like that was something that I had never seen before. I had never seen people from all over the world. Like it was like this universality of the Catholic church like made real for me. And it was also this, this notion of, you know, I had never seen like sick people, because in Lord's, you know, sick people, old people and children always come first. Like they're always at the focal point and everybody is kind of at their service. 
And I had never seen that before in my life. I mean, especially in the military, everybody has to be fit for duty. Yeah. So your extended, you know, older relatives aren't nearby, and so it, right. and it, it was so it's a really different experience. It was, yeah, and it was just really revolutionary for me because I think I had so much of internalized anger and, and pain going on from things in my own home and things in my own life um, that I didn't really know how to deal with. Um, that when I was forced to to be in this situation where for 10 days I had to serve these people that were you know, sick or disabled or weak or whatever, it like just forced me to completely turn outward. And that was powerful for me, like that changed me. And it's funny because the service, I was so young that the only service I could do was to dry dishes. So they put me in the Akai Notre Dame, I think my first year, and I must have dried thousands and thousands of dishes. <laughs> but it was literally my favorite part of the day. I, I looked forward to like my, you know, cause you have the morning shift and the afternoon shift. And, um, yeah, just seeing how how special it was to these these pilgrims, these you know old people that you know our, our world is very much focused on people that are young and healthy and able bodied and you know what can you offer me and so people that you know might be in a wheelchair or you know struggle with some kind of disease or illness or even just old age, they're just they're kind of put on the back burner like people don't notice them as much and um, but God put them like right up front and center and it just was powerful for me. And so and when we're washing the dishes, our youth, we say, who's eating off of this dish? Because the dining room is filled with so many people that are sick, and they don't know this dish. And the answer is Jesus Christ. So you're washing the dish. Each person yeah. is Christ. I was going to ask, what was it? You said it, was, it became my favorite part of the day. Like, what? Why? I just, because I, I think, because it, it forced me to turn outward. I had been so focused on, like, inward on my own like problems I was having at home or, or things going on with my mom or um, just I had so much anger about so many other things going on in my life that um, when I would go and do service and see people that were genuinely so touched just by like me serving them a meal or washing their plate or collecting their dirty dishes they were so genuinely touched you could see that it touched them to the very heart of their soul um, and that just, it gave me like a new sense of hope and purpose. And it made me realize that the only thing that really matters is um, being of service and charity to other people. And that brought me into a deeper, um, I don't know, into a deeper walk with my faith. Where suddenly, before I was just like, oh, I have to go to Mass on Sundays. But um, after this experience, it was almost like, no, like I get to be a part of a worldwide international community. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. You know, the mass is always the same. The sacraments are always the same. It might be in a different language. There might be different customs um, or traditions, but it's always the same. And like, I get to be a part of this family. Like, I've just wasted this opportunity. Like, I almost just wanted to throw it away before. You know, because when I tell people, when you like you say, you came here really kind of, you, you even said kind of insolent or belligerent or, yeah. you know, and I tell people, they say, that's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> but when you came, it was a difficult time in your life. And you were keeping a lot of things to yourself. And I think that's true of a lot of people. They have an internal suffering. And we really don't know what someone's really suffering in their life. We don't know what somebody's enduring. And, you know, I, I can remember saying that to my own children. They'd say, why do you let those people cut in front of you? And why are you? I say, because I, I don't know what's happening in their life. Maybe... They, they just, they're, maybe they're distracted because there's some tragedy or some, we don't know. And I think often the people that are smiling the most are the ones that are suffering. But at 12, to try to manage a bunch of different things that are happening and keep that together is pretty challenging. So for you, it was a struggle. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm the oldest of five kids, and um, my mom actually was not married when she had me. And so I, it was just me and my mom for probably the, the first three years of my life, I would say. Um, and then the man who, he's, the, the older he gets, the more I'm like, he is, he's got such a spirit of St. Joseph, he really does. But um, anyway, the man who became my adoptive father ended up moving into the same apartment complex that my mom and I lived in at the time. And my mom, was, you know, she was trying to get her degree as a nurse, so she was going to night school, and so she was just trying to juggle the, the challenges of being a single mom and 
you know, trying to figure out how she was going to provide for me if this is the sole breadwinner or whatever. And um, anyway, she fell in love with the man who became my adoptive father. They, they got married, and he adopted me, and then he was in the military, so we immediately ended up moving, and we ended up moving every three years after that, and um, they had the rest of my four siblings. So um, I think the constant change was good for me, but um, my mom, I think as she started to have the rest of my siblings, she, she struggled really deeply even before the rest of my siblings came along with anxiety and depression. And um, I'll, she, she displayed a lot of the things that would be typical of something that you might see in somebody that has like bipolar disorder or borderline personality, just really up and then really down, no warning. Um, and sometimes when she would have these kinds of episodes that got worse as I got older, um, she would just be very self-destructive. And... Um, and being the oldest, like I, you know, my the, the next the gap between me and my next brother is five and a half years, and so um, I think I saw a lot of things from her pain and the ways that she acted out and lashed out that um, really kind of I don't know just caused me to be really really angry and like resentful because um, she was just so unstable in so many ways. She was a wonderful mother, by the way. She was a wonderful mother and. The thing that I, I always attribute to her the most is she had this incredible faith, just this beautiful, I mean, just this beautiful, hopeful faith. She's, she's a convert. And so are you. She was a convert, yeah. And brought you in. Technically, yes, I'm technically a convert because <laughs> you know she well she was you know she was technically she was some form of Protestant before she met my dad. Uh, my dad grew up in um, Binghamton, New York, and. He came from a long, like a big Irish Catholic family, and so he had, you know, priests in his family, nuns in his family, and so my mom never really grew up with anything, and so she knew when she met him that she wanted me to have some kind of a faith because that, that was something she never had and always wanted. And so she ended up converting as like a formality because she wasn't really anything, and she ended up just falling so deeply in love with the faith. And so I wasn't actually baptized, I don't think, until I was five. Um, but... Yeah, so she was incredible. I mean, she she taught us so much about the faith. I mean, prayed the rosary with us, like just really helped. Like the greatest gift that she gave us, me and all my siblings, is the gift of, of faith. Um, but she struggled immensely, and she struggled really deeply. And so um, that was always something that was like very hard for me. And um, when I was, so that was, that was going on. I don't think I really knew how to handle that because... Um, you were a kid. Yeah, because I was yeah. a kid and, you know, whatever. And I could see she was in so much pain, but I also, you know, I didn't know how to help her. And, you know, she would lash out a lot. She would get very angry and, like I said, self-destructive, whatever. Um, and then when I was about seven years old, I, um, I, was, I was molested by a neighbor. Um, and it was, it was obviously very traumatic, but it was something that I didn't really understand at the time, like what had happened. I just knew that it was wrong. I knew that it was something that um, should not have happened. And I think under normal circumstances, like had I felt that my mom um, would have been able to handle something like that, like I would have gone and talked to her about it, but I didn't want to make her her problems worse or anything like that. So I just, just kept it to myself and I didn't tell either of my parents. I just, it became like a big secret. Of course, you know, everybody has secrets. Everybody has things that they go through, but, and normally if, <clears throat> you don't deal with something, it just festers. And that's the thing. Like if you don't if you don't get healing for something, it just festers. And so for like those that span of time before I went to Lourdes, and even after that first experience, it was something, this huge like weight, this burden that I had. And I just um felt so not good and so angry and just so kind of like unlovable for because I just didn't understand. I didn't understand like why that would have happened that it must have been something that I had done. Like, I thought that it was my fault in many ways. And I couldn't talk to my mom about it. And I, I couldn't really talk to my dad about it because he was so um, just preoccupied taking care of my mom. And, you know, I didn't want to add to his stress. And so I just kind of just stuffed it deeper and deeper and deeper. And um, then when I <laughs> got to adolescence, I started lashing out at, like, everybody, and specifically at my dad. Um, and my mom 
really thought that it was an issue of you know him being, you know, because I would say horrible things like, you're not my real dad, like you can't tell me what to do, like all these different kinds of things. And it had nothing to do with him at all. Um, but he was just, he was just there, you know, and it was just the thing that I could, you know, um, that I could vocalize or cast the blame on. And so all that was going on, and when I went to Lourdes the first time, I just had this overwhelming like feeling of God's like intense love for me. And this feeling that, um, you know, there was, there was a safe, there was a safe place in the faith and there was a safe place with God. And I don't think I could even like vocalize that or like vocalize, verbalize that, I think, at that age. But I think that's really how I felt. And I think that's when I just like ran headlong into like this conversion of faith because I've always been the type of person that if I do something, I do it all the way. <laughs> and um, so it just, it was so powerful. And I, I had found this place where like, okay, well, this can be a place of solace for me. Like I found new purpose. Um, and it, I think Lord's gave me a lot of grace to deal with a lot of the issues that, you know, were going on back at home and issues that um, my mom was facing that, you know, they didn't always get better. Um, of course, there were times that were worse than others, but I had like a new, pers I had a new perspective, which was very revolutionary for me. You said each summer that you came, there was a different grace that would unfold. You'd think you'd go back, you went once, you had this incredible grace, you're thankful, and you go back to thank, and you get another grace. And yeah. for you, it gave you a wholeness in your respect and relationships with men and women, and allowed you to, you know, of course, you met uh, where you went to school, Franciscan University yeah, through us. I did. Wind up going there and get a degree in theology. So it really, being in Lourdes, really had a huge impact. Oh, absolutely. And still does. It still does. I it, it still does. You know, I I would hope someday to be able to send my kids there. Like I especially cuz there's something different about I think service obviously changes a person in general, absolutely. But there's something so unique about um, putting a child or a teenager in a position where they have to be the hands and feet of service. I think two of besides for faith, I think two of the most powerful things for a child um, to open themselves up to the world and to other people is service and travel. And Lords is kind of both, honestly, because you meet so many people from all over the world and it's this atmosphere of service. And um, so, yeah, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Every year that I went, so the first year was just kind of like this major, like conversion of heart, like this 180 kind of thing. Um, but I'm one year it was confession because I was always terrified of confession. Um, and I had this great confession with this Irish priest and Lords that just made me fall in love with confession. Um, one year it was the Eucharist. I never really understood the, the, the Eucharist. And so I fell in love with the Eucharist one year. Um, one year it was actually when I was 16, I think this was, this was actually really powerful. Um, I finally understood Mary as like my mother um, cause I, I mean, obviously she's the mother of God or whatever, but I finally knew, I like knew serving that year in Lords that she was my mother. And that was really powerful for me as well. And healing for me because I love my mother so deeply. Um, and she was such a wonderful woman in so many ways, but I always felt like I couldn't help her. Like she wouldn't let, she wouldn't like, she wouldn't let me help her. I didn't know how to help her. And there were so many things that I felt like I needed from her that she just wasn't able to give. And I don't hold that against her at all, um, especially, you know, not anymore. There's been a lot of healing that's happened I've, that I've come to this point. But, um, but so Our Lady, you know, just realizing that she knows me and loves me and um, just is there for me in ways that, you know, during those times when my mom couldn't be there in, that, in the way that I needed, she would always be there. And so I just developed this deep, deep devotion to Our Lady um, that I've retained like <laughs> ever since, really. Um, and, and of course, your yeah. mother found a beautiful healing. She did. And Lord's. Yeah, she did. So my mom, after I graduated from school, um, from college, we found out that she had stage four kidney cancer. And um, she, she ended up being sick for about three years before she finally passed. And um, it's, it, it was such a grace of Our Lady because my whole family actually got to go over to Lourdes on a sick pilgrimage, bringing her, uh, which was an answer to prayer because, you know, I had been praying a 54-day rosary novita with my mom that that would happen, um, which just seems crazy because that's, uh, there's seven people in my family. That's a lot of money to go over for a week. But Our Lady provided, literally like on the last day of our novena, we like got a call about going to Lourdes. And um, 
so my whole family got to go over to Lourdes and um, my parents actually got to renew their wedding vows in the grotto. And um, the what I tell people, people like ask me a lot. She eventually, you know, she passed away not long after that. Um, but people ask me, they're like, oh, like, how is it, you know, losing your mom so young? She was 25, I think, when I, when she died. And I always tell them, you know, it's, of course, I miss her every day. Absolutely. Um, but it was such a grace, her suffering, because through her physical illness, Our Lady and the Lord really used that to heal her of her mental suffering. She could never see herself as the beloved child of God that we all saw her. Like the way that other people saw her, she couldn't. She had this disconnect, and, for, and a lot of it was trauma from her own childhood of a different kind. And um, she, she just always struggled, and it wasn't until she was no longer able to do things for herself. She was no longer able to get up to make herself meals or whatever. She had to let people love her. She had to let people serve her. And um, it changed the way that she saw herself. She finally was able to see herself as this beloved child of God. So it was like through illness she was actually healed, which was the biggest grace of all. Um, and that actually brought other people around her to the faith. Um, yeah, so it was very full, cir- full circle. And you found a wholeness in yourself and a respect for yourself and for others, for those who've suffered, you know, abuse from others, that you found um, a grace there in Lourdes, I think in the Piscines. Yeah, so I, I, um, I didn't really start the hard work of actually healing from that childhood experience that, that I had till I was, you know, in college, but my first year in the Piscines, uh, when I when I served there, when I had my experience of the bath, um, I had this internal experience of healing where I I just felt completely cleansed and purified of um, that experience, and I found a forgiveness for the person that did that to me, and um, it was it wasn't even really something that I. I felt like uh, that I knew that I needed. I didn't know that I needed that. Um, but it was just this, this surprise thing where like I felt this like wave of relief and I realized that nothing that had ever happened to me or could happen to me or you know anybody else for that matter, it would never change my inherent dignity. Um, like nothing can ever change our inherent dignity. That was something that I never really understood growing up. Um, so I internalized a lot of that pain and felt like it was something wrong with me. But our Lady healed that as well. And so, and, and, and ironically too, opening up that door of forgiveness for the person that, that did that to me and my abuse also kind of opened up my heart for forgiveness for other people as well, including my mom, because there was a lot of things that I held against her. I was very bitter towards her for, um, for not being a better mother in some aspects. And it just helped me to realize, you know, she she really did the best with what she could. She really, really did. She gave, I mean, and, and even now I tell people the greatest thing that she gave us was the gift of faith. And that's what she always wanted. When I would ask her, what's the greatest thing that you like, what's the most important thing? She's like, I just, I never want you to leave Jesus. And um, she did that. So yeah. Awesome. A couple months before she passed away, I miscarried twin girls. So my sister, um, after I had, I think it was a year after I lost them and after my mom had passed, she went to Lourdes on a service pilgrimage and um, she called me um, soon after she had gotten back and she said, Allie, I have, to, I have to tell you this experience that I had. And I said, okay, because I had asked her when she went, I was like, can you please just take a bath for my twins? Um, you know, when you go to the piscines, offer a bath up for my twins. And she said, yes, yes, of course I can do that. And so She said that um, when she had a little bit of downtime between service, she went to do the Stations of the Cross up Cross Mountain. And um, I have not been back since they put in this installation, but I guess at the very end of the Stations of the Cross, um, they built a, I guess, like a a, a tomb or a grotto for um, infants that have been miscarried, stillborn, lost. Consolation. Yeah, yeah. and so so she said, so I, I felt really called to just go in there and say a prayer for your twins. So she said, so I went in there and I closed my eyes and I began to, you just say a quick prayer for each of your twins. And I can't describe it, but I had the strongest vision for probably like, it was just, it was very quick. It was for like a minute, but the strongest image of mom, our mom in heaven. And on either side of her were two little girls, 
they were, she was holding hands with two little girls on either side, and they were both about five years old with long curly brown hair. And they were just so happy. And she's like, and then as quick as it came, it was so strong, as quick as it came, it was gone. And I just was stunned. And she was like, Hallie, did you hear what I said? And I was like, yeah. I had never told my, my sister that whenever, for whatever reason, whenever I picture my twins, I always picture them to be about five years old with long curly brown hair. I'd never told her that. Um, so that was a great um, consolation um, for me um, to, to hear that and to know that. And, and that it came from Lourdes. And then it came from Lord. I mean, of course it did. <laughs> Everything in my life, every good thing, like has come from Lords. I mean, the gifts they just keep on giving. So, um. thank you so much for sharing your heart with us and your experience of Lords, and for coming every year. And you're just a beautiful soul. And you know, Father, maybe we can pray for those who have suffered, you know, in some way, or are hiding, or or carrying a secret, or and maybe those whose mothers are are dying and to have the beautiful grace that Ellie and her mother experienced, maybe we can pray together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So Lord Jesus, you who are divine physician, and you who promised to send us the Holy Spirit as our comfort and our counselor, so we now give you permission we thank you for your daughter, Allie. We thank you for her mother. We thank you for the beauty of Allie's life and the beauty of her mother's life and the beauty of their family and all that they suffered, all that they struggled through. And we thank you for the healing that you've, you've won in your daughter, Allie, in her heart, especially in the forgiveness of the release, Lord that we don't have to continuously live with the trauma of the past that we don't have to continuously live with the abuse that was once thrust upon us and then we continue to thrust it upon ourselves. It's no longer needed. So Jesus, give us the grace of courage to surrender it to you and to receive the gift of your healing and your kindness. Jesus, I pray for the water of Lords to be washed over all of those men and women who are watching this who are in need of the healing of their mind and the healing of their hearts. That any trauma or any abuse of the past or anything that has been lit, lying dormant in their heart, a secret that has caused them to live in pain and sorrow and despair or discouragement, that you, Jesus, would lift that from their life and you might allow the gift of your joy to reside within them. Because, Jesus, you are the divine physician. There was not a single person in scripture who asked to be healed that you declined. So now heal your sons and daughters. I thank you and I praise you for the courage and the vulnerability and the humility of your daughter, Allie. I thank you for Our Lady of Lords, the Immaculate Conception. And I ask for the grace of a peaceful death for all of those who are preparing to meet you. And through Mary, the Immaculate Conception, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.